The means by which we define death has evolved over time. Historically, somatic criteria such as rigor mortis, decomposition or decapitation are the oldest in human history and are intuitively understood by all of us to equate to death. Both the Bible and the Quran mention the link between breathing and life, as does every movie scene you've ever seen of someone coming back to life from apparent death. Invariably, there is a dramatic, gasping breath. Historically, feathers and candles were used to make the assessment of breathing effort, but this was not always accurate, and as recently as the 1800s, coffins were fitted with a rope and a bell to cover for potential mistakes. Such was the public's distrust and death determination. In 1846, in Paris, France, Dr. Eugène Bouchou advocated the use of the stethoscope to assess for the absence of a heartbeat for death determination. After breathing had stopped, the heart invariably followed. He won the Academy of Sciences Prize for the best work on the signs of death and the means of preventing premature burials. Beating out opposing ideas such as introducing leeches near the anus, applying specially designed pincers to the nipples, or piercing the heart with a long needle with a flag at the end, which would wave if the heart was still beating. In modern medicine, the link between breathing and life is still a core concept, but with the advent of intensive care and mechanical ventilators, the boundary became blurred. No longer did the inability to breathe for oneself invariably result in circulatory collapse and death. In 1959, the concept of brain death was first put forward. Coma de passe was defined as an irreversible state of coma and apnea. Such an assessment became used as an indicator of medical futility and defined a point at which ventilation could be stopped. And this brings me to a point I would like to stress, and something that informs my own practice in intensive care, said best by the medical ethicist Gordon Dunstan. The success of intensive care is not to be measured only by the statistics of survival, as though each death were a medical failure. It is to be measured by the quality of lives preserved or restored, by the quality of the dying of those in whose interest it is to die, and by the quality of the human relationships involved in each death. Throughout the 1960s, there was much research and discussion around the neurological criteria for diagnosing brain death. At the same time, tremendous advances were being made in the field of transplantation. This leapt dramatically to the public's attention with the first heart transplant by Christian Barnard in 1967. Suddenly, the world was aware of organ transplantation, that life could be donated after death. But brain death certification had not been widely accepted at this point. With the publication in 1968 by the ad hoc committee of the Harvard Medical School, a definition of irreversible coma, a standard was set in the United States for the determination of brain death. Many other countries then followed suit, setting their own standards for the declaration of death by neurological criteria. That no one set of testing standards is unanimously used across the world reflects the various national, religious and cultural factors that play a role in defining death. This has unfortunately led to many different terms being used to describe neurological death. From brain death, to whole brain death, to brain stem death, and in the latest, in my opinion failed attempt at clarity, total brain failure. What they do, however, all have in common is that they are assessed in the same way. It must be clinically demonstrated in the absence of confounders that there is an irreversible loss of consciousness and an irreversible loss of brain stem activity, which includes the ability to breathe. Terms such as coma and persistent vegetative state are commonly misrepresented as brain death, but these patients are not dead because although consciousness is absent, the brainstem retains some function and typically the potential to breathe unaided remains. Throughout this course, we will use the term brain death as the term to describe death determined by neurological criteria. The legal and religious acceptance of brain death has in most countries followed the publication of national medical guidelines. In the United States, this was in 1981, with the Uniform Determination of Death Act, which explicitly states that brain death is equivalent to death by cardiorespiratory criteria, and that the determination of death must be made in accordance with accepted medical standards. Such legislation often contains stipulations about who can perform the brain death testing. In South Africa, for example, Chapter 8 of the National Health Act of 2008 legislates that it must be two doctors one with more than five years' experience, 
both not involved with the transplant team, who can legally certify a patient brain dead. In some countries, brain death is not accepted, while in others, although scientifically accepted, culturally it may not be. In the United States, in the states of New York and New Jersey, it is possible to set aside the determination of death by neurological criteria on religious grounds. Throughout the course of history, the definition of death has had to be in tune with medical progress and cultural acceptance, and it will continue to have to be so. The determination of death by neurological criteria has stood up to intense scrutiny over time. No one has ever recovered from being correctly clinically certified brain death. As medical advances continue and access to ICU and mechanical ventilation becomes more widespread, it is more important than ever that we understand the correct medical procedures for brain death determination and how to communicate this effectively with families. Brain death is death. Of this there can be no doubt. But we must realize that brain death is more than just scientific testing. It is a step into the unknown, where medicine stops and religion and culture offer solace to grieving families.